and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Jennifer Kirk. And I'm Dave Lease, and today we are super excited to welcome the five-time United States champions, four-time world medalists, Tanith Belbin and Ben Augusto. Tanith and Ben, welcome to The Skating Lesson. We are truly thrilled to have you. Thank you, we are too. We're glad to be here. <laughs> Well, I'm one of those nerds who loves ice dance. I loved it for a long time. And for the last year, I have been on a quest to get Jenny to love the discipline. So why should she love it? Explain it to her. State your case, honey. <laughs> State the case. Let's go. Convince <laughs> me. Well, I think, I think the best part about ice dancing is just following the storylines of the performances. So, you know... Um, whether they suit your taste from one program to the next is always questionable, but I think it's kind of all-encompassing because you don't just get the acrobatics, you get the whole theatrics of what's best about figure skating. So it's hopefully not just one element to the next, it's sort of a, a full piece. The drama, and, you would say. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly, and, and the opportunity for the skaters to show a relationship, not just to tell a story about one person, but about a story about two people experiencing a whole variety of, of emotions and, and experiences. So it's it's more, I think it has a lot more variety to offer. Well, I'll I'm trying. I'm trying. Theoretically. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you first turned professional, we didn't see a lot of you guys skating together. And now you're doing shows. So talk us through your professional careers up to this point, what you've been up to. So I think we skated together for uh, – just over a year after we retired from competition in Vancouver. And then uh, summer of 2011, I, I decided that I actually uh, wanted to stop skating for a little while. Um, you, you know as well as anyone, Jen, how it is. It just like it's everything you've ever known. And you start to wonder what else you might be good at and what other experiences there might be out there that you could pursue if you had a little more time and opportunity and maybe even imagination when you're not exhausted from skating and, and when those walls come down to see the rest of, of what life has to offer. And so um, we still did, you know, skating related things like Battle of the Blades and and um, the ill-fated skating with the stars. <laughs> Not to bring that up, but it was it was always fun to do commentary, which you know we continued to do. But I just needed some time off of the ice, uh, just to have time to imagine what else I might be able to do with my life. Well, having been training together for so long, and when you went to different states. Did you still text daily? I mean, what is that like when you're together all the time and then suddenly you're on other parts of the country? It's a, it's a real shock to not be together yeah. every minute of every day almost. And, you know, we, we skated together for about 13 years before we went our separate ways. And, um, I mean, it was kind of cold turkey. I mean, it was weird. Yeah. It was like we were... We did the Olympics, and then it was like, okay, I'm moving here, and I'm moving there, and I'll uh, see you when we see you. And we, you know, we yeah. stayed in contact, but it was really kind of, um, it was definitely a shock for me. I was just like, wow, like, I wonder what Tanit's doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was just kind of this thing where you're so used to being together. And I think we've we've got a pretty good, we're getting better about, you know, keeping contact, and especially when we have shows coming up, we have a lot of logistics to figure out. So yeah. that's always, uh, you know, a nice nice to get to get together this way to practice like right now we're together we're getting ready for a show next week in Japan and so it's do you nice still have the same to... timing when you get back together as when you're apart the same timing on the ice yeah on the ice does it come back or is uh, it slowly <laughs> it's more <laughs> painful but uh, yeah we get there a little bit slowly yeah I'm always pleasantly surprised like this time it's been several months since we skated together last and the first day is like oh my gosh this is amazing we could just go do the show and then day two is always a little weird you start mm -hmm. to oh wait no that's not together and then we get back together and the timing does come back pretty quickly though. Well you talk about skating together now and we've seen you guys choreographing doing commentary work so do you have a 10 year plan in place both for guys as a couple skating on the ice and then individually off the ice as well? Ooh, I don't even know what I'm going to do next Some year. The USMC, what's going on? What's yeah. going on? <laughs> My periodization chart is way off. You need Tom Z. Um, no, I don't think, I think we're very much in the, the time of our lives where it's kind of, let's see, you know, let's, let's see where we are in a month. Let's do this show and let's see how we feel about the next one. Um, and that's, you know, over the last year, that's 
kept us on the ice because we've always walked away and like Ben said, enjoyed being together again, enjoyed spending time with one another and kind of looked ahead and said, you know, yeah, let's do that other show in two months or in three months. And it gives us a little bit of downtime to sort of go back to our regular lives and handle every other thing that we have going on and then still be able to come together and kind of have these these fun travel adventures together, um, which is the best part about being a professional skater is just being able to see the world and to be able to do it with uh, with someone whom you're so close with and it's just a lot of fun. And it really keeps things fresh, you know, it's like when you're at home and you're in your daily routine, routine, working, working, working and then it's like a vacation to come and skate yeah. and perform and then when you go home it's like, oh yeah, I, all, my, all my stuff that I have going on and, and so it's great and both in that we don't feel like we've, we clearly can't get in a rut together. I mean, yeah. we're together a short time, skate, do the thing and so it's, it's really nice. That balance that yeah. you're hoping to achieve. So given that you're so tied to all these different ice dance camps that you've trained with, people that you've trained with, when you do commentate, how do you avoid any criticisms of bias or any of that and try to separate that? Because obviously you've trained with Igor, you've trained with Marina, you've trained with Lidachuk. How do you kind of separate that as yeah. a commentator? Well, one of the things that makes that easier from my perspective is that ice dance has changed a lot very rapidly um, in our view over the last 10 years um, in particular. And so... I think that ice dancing as as we knew it, maybe while we were training with those coaches or skaters, has evolved to the point where it's comparing apples to oranges in a lot of cases. Um, so yes, of course I'm cognizant of, of you know recognizing one choreographer's work over the other and remembering my experiences with all of that, but thankfully I had, uh, we both did, had phenomenal experiences with Marina and Igor and with Natalia Linenchuk. And so, you know, the, the memory of working with them is so positive, you know, there's, there's no thought uh, when I'm watching other teams, you know, if I've, I'm not looking for specific shortcomings because my experience with these coaches shows me that that's a point where they're lacking, you know, they're the best coaches in the world and, you know, all of their teams show that. So it's pretty easy to do commentary for, for couples whom we train with and for coaches um, whose couples we're now commentating for because they're mostly great. <laughs> and I, I actually think it almost makes it easier having worked with a lot of them because you have extra insight into just how they work and how they are as people and, and really such a great appreciation for their talent and the work that they put into, you know, when you watch a program, it's a four minute program, but there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours of work that's gone into it, as you know. And so just kind of understanding the process and how they each have their own process of putting a program together and involving it. And I think it actually helps be able to give more insightful commentary because of having that experience. Yeah. And I actually, I stopped coaching dance uh, from before I left for Russia, for Sochi. Um, I haven't taught any dance since then. And um, I actually think that's a, a good thing in a way in terms of my commentary because I found myself making comments that were something that a coach would say. And um, it was definitely something that I noted after a year or so and saying, you know what, that's not my role. I'm not here to give them coaching tips, you know, via the microphone. And, and I think it's, it's much better this way because I can I can watch with fresh eyes as everyone else does rather than be too close on the inside. But um, it's definitely easier to have that hat off when it comes to commentating for dance. Well, Tenneth, one of the things I've always wondered about is you were in a French Canadian TV movie, and unfortunately, <laughs> my French is horrible. We were just in Montreal, and it was a mess. In I many ways. We figured out <laughs> what a West meant after a while, but so what was the movie about, and was it lifetime quality? Um, it was less than lifetime quality. <laughs> uh, it was a it was a writer who won some contest to have their you know short story produced uh, on Canadian television, and um, yeah, it was very regional quality. Um, so my, I think the role that I played was um, alongside the main character who was moving to a new city with her parents who had recently divorced and she was having trouble settling in and I was making it harder. So I was, um, 
yeah, I was like the bully on the street. And um, I, I honestly have looked for it because I kind of want to watch because I r recall seeing it years later and recognizing how horrible I was. But I know that there were just like scenes of just like, just like looks and just like <laughs> sneering. There was a lot of just like really, really angry moments on my part. That's, that was my whole role was that I was the complete bully and I just made her feel uncomfortable about herself and it was... The mean girl. <laughs> I was the mean girl, yeah. Exactly <laughs> like her in real life. <laughs> Did you get to do anything dramatic? No, uh, I think I pushed her off her bike, but that's about it. Like she was riding her bike by and I just shut <laughs> her off. That's about it. I didn't have a large role. <laughs> Well, in addition to acting, Tanya, when you started skating, you did singles, and then you also were a pair girl, and of course, dance. So, what were you like as a single skater, and were you one of those gritty pair girls as well? No, um, no, <laughs> I was really not good at both for the most part. Um, singles was a challenge. I definitely, definitely chose wisely in abandoning that. So, um, I had a wrap like up to my armpits, and I didn't like falling. Um, I like to think that I was cool for continuing singles, even though I knew there was no hope for me, but um, it was pitiful. So singles was definitely not my strength. And pairs, I, I enjoyed to a point, but as soon as they started introducing harder tricks, I started feeling apprehensive um, because I'm not the most coordinated person and I'm not really... Um, yeah, I'm not really great with the acrobatics, which is one of the things that made it difficult for us, you know, when the system started changing and those lifts started becoming more and more acrobatic, it, it never felt natural to me. So dance, uh, in particular as it was 10 years ago, <laughs> was definitely comfortable for me comparatively. Well, Ben, you also skated singles and you're known having such mastery over your blade. So to what do you attribute your skating skills and that mastery? Is that, was it something that just came naturally to you the second you stepped on the ice? No, <laughs> uh, I certainly didn't have an immediate mastery. Although I do remember being a little kid and just doing public sessions. I was always pretty good at going fast, but I was not good at stopping. So I would just slam into the boards. Like that was my go-to stop is just hit the boards. <laughs> Um, when I was little and I was a um, single skater, like I only got up through ISI Freestyle 7, like Double Sow was, yeah, rock and roll. <laughs> and, but I was like a really chubby little kid, and so I was kind of gravitationally challenged, as it were. And so <laughs> That's a nice I way started, of putting it. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you like I would jump data. and I wouldn't really go up that high. But uh, when, when I started doing dance, like I immediately, I remember just loving like skating with a partner. Like, I just thought that was so cool. And there all these ideas of how cool it could be with two people instead of one. And, and I really loved it. I do remember when I was a kid, I had a really cool footwork program because, you know, you could do compulsory elements or footwork. And so it was to Batman. Da -da -da -dun -da -dun -da 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 you know the Batman theme and it was like the coolest program. So maybe <laughs> that kind of started me on the the path of using my edges and being really into that. And so yeah, it's been it's been fun since then. Getting into those beats. Well, for those who don't know, tell us the story of how you two teamed up and found each other. Um. So I was in Montreal and Ben was in Chicago. Um. I was with a coach in Canada who was primarily focused on singles and pair skating. And um, when I had left pairs, there wasn't really a role for me anymore in his school, but he wanted to help me find my way in dance. So he uh, had seen Igor and his competitors at international events and said, look, this is the best coach in North America, hands down. And if you want to be an ice dancer, that's where you have to be. So give it a try. And... Um, I remember my parents just asking me, you know, this is the this is the pivotal point in your career. You know, we're either all in and we're just going to basically bankrupt ourselves and move to another country for your skating, but you have to want it more than anything else. And um, I definitely wanted to go. And we flew there, I think, two days later to Detroit. I had a tryout with Igor by myself. And then while I was there, he actually introduced me to um, Charlie Butler, um, who used to skate with Jessica Joseph, but they had recently uh, split up and he was debating whether or not he was going to keep competing. Um, and so originally I actually moved to Detroit to kind of tentatively have this this um, extended tryout period with Charlie Butler. And um, that's I think that's like a little part of our story that, yeah. <laughs> that we don't often say because yeah. it's like, oh, well, Igor put us together and that's it. But I actually moved to Detroit with no knowledge of Ben um, and I believe you were still with your old partner at that time. Yeah. So, 
Um, but by the time I got to Detroit and got on the ice the first day, they told me Charlie quits. So, <laughs> like, thanks. Yeah. Just ruined my life there. Detroit, yeah. And here I am. And within a week, Ben, uh, Igor told me, Susie Wynn has this boy. He's available. It, he just came up on the market, so to speak. And I think he'd be a good fit. And we had a tryout that weekend on a Sunday with no one else at the rink. And, uh, and it was great. Yeah, it yeah. was amazing. I'll let you tell your story. Yeah, well, and it was, it was really good timing because I was skating with a girl named Katie Hill, and she was a great skater. And all of a sudden, she was getting taller and taller and taller. <laughs> she's like 6'2 now. I think. Like, she's really <laughs> wonderfully tall, beautiful skater, but like, I'm like, oh, no. So that wasn't working out. So we had to find something else. And um, yeah, it was perfect timing. And Susie, Susie Wynn, my coach in Chicago, she told me, like, Igor is same as tennis coach. Igor is the best, and if you are serious about dance, this is where you need to go. You need to be with him. And so, yeah, I went to Detroit. We had the tryout. I think I fell, like I fell on my face, and she was like, "That's okay." I was like, "Yes." She laughed <laughs> at a joke. I was like, "This is gonna be awesome," and it was great. And I remember Igor saying that it was like the best tryout he'd ever seen, and it was just very natural. And a week later, I think I moved there, and yeah. we were there pretty much for the next ten years. Well, so many parent dance teams tell us that they become romantically involved during the tryout. And Alexa and Chris told us that it started in Camaro before they even got home from the airport. <laughs> so were there ever sparks between the two of you? Never, actually. No. Um, we never had that dynamic no. at all. I think the timing of when we got together in relation to our ages also mm -hmm. sort of set this older brother kind of um, dynamic with Ben um, been with me because I think yeah. you must have been I was 16. 16 and I was 13. She was like 13 like. And you remember between 13 and 16, that's a really big difference, you know? You're, you're running with the big dogs or you're still a kid. Okay. And, um, and so I, I was pretty aware right away, as was my relationship with all of my past pair partners, that I was younger and that, you know, he was the older, more mature part of the partnership. And, yeah. um, and I mean, Ben started dating his girlfriend Mary. I think a year, like a year later, a yeah. year after, and they've been together ever since. So, yeah, we never, it just never had the, the chemistry like that. But thankfully, we had the chemistry on the ice. And I think the ease about knowing the dynamic of our relationship and what it meant to us off the bat allowed us to pursue those romantic characters right. without any conflicting feelings or confusion. Yeah, and you know, it's when we first moved there. You were living with the family, yeah, and then I was living with their neighbors. So like, there was a girl who skated, and she stayed with them. And then their neighbors were empty nesters, like, yeah, we'll take a skater. And so we were just there, like living with people that we didn't really know. And I had a car, and I was I would drive us to the rink. And so it was kind of like right off the bat, we were both kind of just in this together, yeah, uh, in a new place. Our fa our parents hadn't weren't able to move yet, and so there was definitely a feeling of we were already kind of like a little family and and just doing stuff looking out for each other um, yeah and that's kind of always always stayed that way mm -hmm. well ice dance was not a particularly strong discipline in the US at that time so what were your initial goals when you got together <laughs> first represent the United States because yes. there's a lot of opportunity <laughs> <laughs> um, initially when we got together um, we we had faith because of Igor's reputation that if he saw something in us that there was something there worth putting every bit of effort we had every day into. Um, we didn't compete for a year. So the challenge initially was just keeping our attention span, I think, because <laughs> yeah. we really wanted a program and we really wanted to do compulsory dances. And um, Igor would only let us stroke for like the first eight months or so um, with and with Igor, uh, especially at that time, you know, he was so tough, just yeah. so tough on us all the time. And you want to be able to show like, okay, my stroking's not great, but if you just give me a program, I've got a great face, you know, and just, but I had to just stroke and stroke and stroke. Yeah. And I think initially our goals were just to reach a point in our basic skating where he deemed us worthy of taking the next step into more creative aspects of ice dance. And then... Um, it seemed once we started doing that really quick to our first event and um, our first competition was Lake Placid, the summer dance event 
And we were assigned a Junior Grand Prix at that competition after we competed, which was only a month away. Yeah. So we were really quick into our um, competitive career I mean, internationally. Yeah, and it, it was a different time. I, I look at a lot of skaters now, and everybody, they, they want to get a program. They want to compete tomorrow. And I think maybe because we didn't have, like, Google right at our fingertips and we weren't like it's very much about instant gratification right now and we were just we wanted to skate we wanted to do dance we wanted to get better and that was like enough mm -hmm. and we just figured well Igor knew what he was doing so we would do what he said and so it wasn't like okay so we're gonna do this and then we're gonna compete next week and we're gonna get our program like it was just we were just doing what he told us to do and mm -hmm. he had a great plan and um, yeah the stroking for a year was something that I think blows people's minds because I remember we would just have lessons, like a two-hour lesson on forward crossovers. Mm -hmm. Liz Coates was our other coach, a British lady, incredible technician, and she would just watch us and, and push and cross and for like hours. And we're like, <laughs> That's, you know, then when we got together and we finally competed, people were blown away and like, you guys look like you've been skating together forever. And we felt like we had at that point. I mean, yeah. it was, that foundation was there. You ascended through the ranks so quickly. I remember competing with you guys on the Junior Grand Prix, and it was like out of nowhere. You're meddling at all these events. And en route to winning your first national title in 2004, there was such talk about you guys, again, winning at that event. Take us through winning that first title. Oh, yeah. that's. I always say out of our whole career that that's my favorite skating memory is, is winning our first U.S. championships because... Um, you know, as you guys know, many a time skaters will say the U.S. championships put more pressure on you and you feel like it's it's the most important stage for you to take, even if you know you have worlds coming up. Sometimes U.S. championships just feel like the most important event. And, uh, and, and it really did feel like it to us that year. And we had really blown it the year before um, where Naomi and Peter had, had won their last championship before retiring um, the following year. And we were leading in the uh, then original dance, and we just imploded for the free dance. And so we had to wait a whole year and lick our wounds and bring our heads out of the clouds and recognize that it doesn't and shouldn't come that easy. And we really, really had to. I think that instance really pushed us to um, take a big step in our skating in that year so that we felt more deserving of being national champions, not because we happen to have a good skate, but because we proved it all year long. Um, and and yeah, that was an incredible, incredible competition. I, I feel like we skated really well. Um, we had been competing for a couple of years internationally to the point where we had um, some nice support from the audience. So our program was, uh, was it the Gypsy program? It was Beatles, or Elvis. Elvis, Elvis yeah, right, right. Oh, right. No Elvis Beatles program. Really a nicely known program um, within the small dance community uh, as something that we felt was unique to us and, and set us apart in a way that we felt comfortable with in terms of our strengths. And so um, it was just a really great year, and and we really felt like like we had improved a lot and taken on a lot more difficulty in that program mm -hmm. and were, more, were much more um, worthy of of at least having the opportunity to win their first title in that moment. So it felt it felt right. Yeah. And the year before is like one of my least favorite and favorite moments in our careers as well, like when we didn't win because... No, we, it was El Elvis we lost. Oh, yeah. So so we next kicked, year. I kicked you in the head and then I was like crying during <laughs> the performance because I knew I'd lost already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It that was, was the next the year. Next year and I and maybe it was West was, Side Story uh, West Side or something. Story, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with Elvis, it was like we had such a great short and we're like, we're in first. And I vividly remember being back in my hotel and thinking like, oh, all the wonderful things that are going to come when, <laughs> when we become national champions, yeah. like tomorrow when we become national champions and how that just completely took us out of our, our heads and then we went and just skated a terrible free dance and we couldn't yeah. keep, we were bumping into each other, like you said, the lift went over and kicked me in the head and it's just like, wow, well that was terrible and what a great lesson that we learned yeah. from that, that you know, you, you can't put yourself ahead, like you have to just, each moment is the most important moment you're in. Yeah. And so. We didn't have the maturity to win it any sooner than we did. No. Um, and even when we did, we were so fortunate to be able to be given that title um, relatively early in our career so that we could 
have that mantle to continue to understand our responsibilities in that position and to develop our maturity and to feel more challenged and more motivated to continue to deliver the best performances we could to honor that title for the United States. Well, you went on to defend the title the next season and you won your first world medal in 2005. And this was the first year that the international judging system was used at the world championships. What do you think it was about your skating that gave you such a competitive advantage under that system so early on? I think it was um, probably primarily Igor and his choreography and the fact that he, um, he excelled in particular with complex footwork and steps and arm transitions that were less common at the time, particularly with the couples who uh, were sort of in for their second quadrennial, um, you know, carrying on a, a slightly older style of dance that, you know, with the new system was harder to accept. But I really feel like his style was um, was new and different and helped set us apart. And it was very geared towards cramming in as much content as you could into the program and um, and letting that difficulty and complexity show um, as a feature and as a strength of the program. And um, yeah, I think his work in, in, in that kind of choreography style was, was probably one of our greatest strengths yeah, in that absolutely. moment. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we had a benefit in that it was nothing was normal for us. Like, it, all, it seemed like almost as soon as we started competing, they started changing stuff very soon after, right? Yeah. And so we never were used to doing things a certain way. Like every year, oh, new rules, okay, we'll figure it out. Whereas some of the older generation, they were going, what? Like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. We don't, it was hard, it's hard to adjust. And I feel like that's how we would feel if we tried to jump back in right now. We'd be like, what's happening? Like, this is so different. And so we were never, it was never a big deal. Like something mm -hmm. new every year was just the norm for us. Yeah. And so I think that that helped us to just be able to, move on to actually working on it and getting it the way we need it to be. And the other the other aspect of our skating and our training that changed around that time was the introduction of Marina into our coaching staff, you know. Um, and she came in very, obviously, as she is very confident in, um, in her style and, and her aesthetic. And I think ultimately as uh, Igor and Marina grew as a, as a coaching partnership, um, we were able to benefit so greatly from both their perspectives so that the complexity was complemented with um, the artistic thoughtfulness and, um, the and timing and vision that Marina brought to our skating as well. So I think that was just sort of the perfect storm of a time in our career where we started to tap into some of the most incredible resources the Ice Dance World had to offer with those two coaches. And we were also physically uh, able and young and and very excited to take on those challenges of Ben said and continue to evolve with the sport because we were excited in the direction it was heading. Well, I was recently at a wedding last summer. My best friend got married, and I was seated next to Paul Virtue, who I had no idea oh. who he was, but it turned out that that was your immigration lawyer. Yeah. So at what point did you start to seriously consider expediting your citizenship and know that it was a possibility for those Olympics? Yeah. 2002. <laughs> um, well, we were always, we always knew that I would pursue citizenship. Um, we didn't expect, yeah, we didn't expect that we would be eligible to make the Olympic team in 2002 as we were. Um, and so I think that uh, that was the catalyst to looking more in depth into um, how long it was going to take because all we knew was that it was going to take a while and that we couldn't start right away because you have to, uh, as an independent, apply under um, a category called extraordinary ability. And at that point, there, was, um, there wasn't there was very much extraordinary about our careers in terms of the big picture, obviously. So I needed to gain um, as much of a resume with Ben as I could to present to say that um, there was something that I could contribute that was a specialty um, as a citizen. And so we were still accumulating that in our minds. And then in 2002, yeah, when we qualified at nationals as the second couple, but weren't able to go because of my citizenship, it wasn't heartbreaking because we never thought we would come second or be eligible um, at that point, let alone had the thought of the Olympics even crossed our mind. You know, we, we weren't even national champions yet. We had a lot of ground to cover. 
Um, but between 2002 and 2006, we had um, the great fortune through Ben's cousin to be um, to be tied in with um, a lobbyist originally yeah, yeah. Um, turned immigration lawyer turned I think retiree ultimately yeah, right. who um, who wanted to help us and without his help um, pro bono there was no way no way and he was the one who got the bill composed he was the one who got the bill signed um, I cannot fathom the cost of yeah. an immigration lawyer doing that for anyone else and he was willing to do it for us um, completely free of charge out of the goodness of his heart because he took an interest in our story and um, and thought it was worth his time and so um, yeah he took the ball and ran with it and um, at some point came to us and said hey I don't know if you know this but the uh, the immigration system has changed there is an expedited process between two of the major steps now they're consolidated into one and had you applied one year later than you did you would have your citizenship before 2006 but because I applied one year earlier when the old uh, order of operations was in place I wouldn't get my citizenship until 2007 or 8 and so um, you know that was something we had no idea about yeah. either and so with uh, with Paul's help, you know, drafting everything and making sure that it all came through at the right time and piggybacking. I mean, we learned so much about <laughs> yeah. Congress yeah. and the American government and passing bills. And we people. flew yeah. out there. We flew out to D.C. and he took us through the, the, the Capitol building and we, you know, we went to senators' offices and yeah. had meetings to kind of, so they could meet us and put a face to what, what this was. And I mean, it was a spectacular experience. Yeah, we actually, I, I just the other day found a letter from Senator Obama. <laughs> oh. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. Wow. Uh, you know, just saying that he had received the information and that he wished us the best of luck. And, hmm. you know, that, that whole experience looking back, you know, is a big blur. But um, it was unbelievable and, and so cool. It just, I mean, the odds of it working out for us the way it did are one in a million. And he got that bill piggybacked on to another one and it passed and you know we First got it didn't it yeah, was it, it was attached failed. to a, a spending <laughs> bill which then was like you know what we're not going to deal with this until the next time we come back and we're like no <laughs> yeah. and we, then we thought it was done but then somehow there was another bill that signed, yeah. it got put in there and last minute and I mean we literally sat and watched C-SPAN at the rink to just watch Congress in session, to wait for our bill to come up, to see if it passed. But the wonderful thing about it was that it didn't just affect me. It wasn't tailored for me. It was, you know, it was brought to uh, Paul's attention because of our story. But it wasn't just about me. It was about this whole group of a uh, large number of people who were in the same boat as me, who just happened to be swept up into this old system. And until they finished their journey through citizenship, couldn't get out of it and everyone who applied later was passing them over in the timeline and that just didn't seem fair to him and uh, we're so glad that other people thought so too and um, you know obviously point in case another dance couple um, Morgan Matthews and Max Zavazin who were junior national champions mm -hmm. the year before yeah. he got his citizenship as well because of the same bill um, in time for the 2006 Olympics so it's it's a really I mean what are the odds, you yeah. know, that that would work out the way it did? And our whole life changed because somebody heard about our story and got a bill passed. <laughs> Amazing. And oh. what was crazy, too, is that then she had to go in to get her citizenship. It was literally the last day. of mm -hmm. It was December 31st, and I think it was a Sunday, right? Yeah. And the immigration office here in Detroit opened up special just so she could come in to be sworn in. And it was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So many things that came together. Yeah. So that that could... Happened. It was really, it was really cool. <laughs> At the start of that season, how much of that impact your training, worrying about whether or not you were going to get the citizenship? How did you stay focused and kind of get yourself up for a potential disappointment if you were to win another national title and not be able to go to the Olympics? Yeah, we really, um, as Ben mentioned, the the bill had been defeated and. Things changed so quickly that when we started the season, we were quite certain there was no chance whatsoever of me getting my citizenship. And so we approached the season um, with a goal of making as much of a statement as we could. 
so that, you know, hopefully our absence would be noted, if nothing else, you know, in terms of the international mix. And we wanted to make sure, I think Marina was really the one psychologically who helped us in that instance, telling us that you need to be so good that people, even during these Olympic Games, are excited for the next quadrennial because you'll be, you know, in the forefront of it. That was really our our mindset was, you know, we need to make people excited to see what we have to offer four years from now. Well, one of the American teams you competed against, David Mitchell and Lauren Gallarabinowitz, attempted to derail those attempts for your citizenship. So how did you become aware of that? I think we got a phone call. Yeah, I, um, I think it was probably Paul or, or Jessica, your cousin, mm, or someone yeah, yeah. Someone called us to bring it to our attention, um, you know, from inside. And, and you know, their, their opinions and their voices were just, you know, just as, as worthy of being heard, you know, as our plea. And so we understood. Um, and at that time, I think it was just like another bump in the road, like another thing. Oh, another, you know, because we, like we said, we didn't think that it was going to work out. It seemed impossible. And so to have another, um, yet another obstacle in front of us, it sort of just blended in with all the rest, I think. Um, but it was definitely, I mean, every time something else came up, it was hard. It was really hard to to have a little bit of hope and then to think, no, like, it's not going to happen. Um, but it was easy not to take it personally because we know David and Lauren and uh, we had known them for many years at that point. And anyone who knows them knows that they're very sweet, very kind people. And, um, and you know, they were dedicating their entire life to skating as well. And so they were just doing what they had to do, you know, to make sure, sure that they were in the best position possible as well and what they felt was was right. Yeah, and I think, you know, we really... Thinking that it wasn't going to work out. Oh, hey. Somebody say hello. Yes. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> hello Sorry. and welcome to the skating lesson. Yo, hey. Interruption. Um, you know, really believing that it wasn't going to work out, that we had to make a statement, I think in a way was helpful mentally because it took a lot of pressure off of us. You know, the whole Olympic season is so crazy for everybody who when they're training and the only thing in your mind is – the Olympics at the end of this season. And it's, I think it makes it really hard for people to train effectively because they're not able to focus on what they have to do right now, today, this session, this run through. It's all, it's easy to get ahead of yourself. Like we learned yeah, <laughs> the national national championships national. several years before. Um, but it's always this thing that's looming. And so I think for us having that big cloud of this Olympics that are coming, having that kind of just removed for most of the season because it was just something that we had written off it was probably helpful for us to be able to train and not have that just constantly in our minds. And then when it all of a sudden was possible, that was just this bonus. And yeah, then you're excited icing. about it instead of yeah, dreading then we're excited. it. Yeah. Sorry. ATT U-verse is very persistent. Oh. <laughs> they really want my business. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in 2005, it seemed like the judges loved you at Worlds, and then it appeared that the Olympics and Worlds the next year were a tougher battle for you. So explain this. Was it politics? Was the material of your competitors much stronger? How did things kind of change to become much tighter the next season? I don't know. I wasn't in the meeting. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's the thing, you know? You you do your best, and you hope it reads as well yeah. as you think it does. I mean... If we knew we would find a way to make sure that we, you know, had the best impression possible every season, but um, it's probably any combination of the things you mentioned. You really never know. Um, and like Ben mentioned, at the time, the system was changing every year. And so the judges and officials were constantly having discussions about where the where the sport should go, what direction ice dance should go in, and what they were looking for from one season to the next changed a lot as well, as far as we've heard. So, um, you know, we all just did our best to keep up. And, um, and you know, I think in the case of, for example, Marilyn, Charlie, and Tessa and Scott, you don't just want to keep up with the new system. You want to revolutionize it. You want to define it, you know. And, and um that was, you know, something that we tried to do, but it was hard to keep ahead of, I think. And, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to say. Yeah, and I think in 2005, it really felt like Igor was kind of out in front of, of 
what they were looking for and really with our, our gypsy free dance I, and maybe you know it was like russian gypsy free dance and we were in russia and it was like it went over so well and i i really felt like we skated that beyond what we had been able to perform in in the past and then you know the next year now everybody has a year to to get even more familiar with what what they're looking for what the system is so um, if we maybe had some little feeling like we were out in front, then everybody else is, is catching up and getting out in front of that. And um, every year, more and more teams get more comfortable with what they have to do. And, and so then you have to even go more out in front to try to push the boundaries. Um, you know, and, and everybody just steps up their game that much more. Mm-hmm. At the 2006 Olympic Games in the original dance, you had one of your signature performances of your career to Let's Get Loud. And that was one of the most bizarre and notorious nights in Olympic figure skating history. So take us through that performance and how does that rank for you guys in terms of your all-time greatest skates? Um, it definitely it definitely is way up there for mm-hmm. sure. Um, as you mentioned, it was super strange. Everyone, like the top seven couples fell when it's already so rare to fall in ice dance as it is, at least it definitely was back then before the trips were as challenging as they are today. So um, we were standing sort of in a back hallway. I think we were last to skate or second to last to skate. So we heard them all. And the crowd, um, which was very engaged in the event because the um, the Italians, Barbara Fuserpoli and Maurizio Margaglio had come back and they were really, really invested in the outcome of this event. And so they were responding very audibly to these falls and crashes. And so there was no doubt in our mind that something dramatic was happening over and over and over. Um, It was a little hard to believe in the end when we heard about it that so many couples had the same um, outcome. But uh, we were definitely aware. And I think going in, as you mentioned, um, not as favorites by any means, hoping to just stay in the top five, we felt like we had nothing to lose. You know, we should just go out there and uh, show off this program that we really enjoyed doing, that we had really uh, grown into over the course of the season. And I think ultimately that was a huge lesson for us to learn in contrast to our past experiences where we got too far ahead of ourselves. In this case, we just kind of said, you know what, this has already been an incredible two months. Mm -hmm. I became an American citizen at the very last minute. We had an incredible nationals and now we get to go to the Olympic Games and let's just keep having a great party. And that's all it was. And it was the perfect program for that. If we had had something dramatic, I don't know if it would have turned out the same because this program was very in tune with our emotions in that moment. And um, yeah, it was, oh, it was awesome. I loved everything <laughs> about that. Yeah. And what was so crazy, Tanith mentioned the crowd. Um, the whole two weeks before we competed, we were, that, we were at the Olympics for two weeks before we skated that performance. And... Every day we were in the practice group with the Italians and they had, I think they just won the world championships the year before. So they were like heavily favored. No, but they were they world came back champions. They came back and retired. Uh, yeah. Okay. They were world champions. In Italy, they were heavily favored to win and it was certainly possible. And so every practice that we had, like every day, there was at least 2,000 people yeah. in the building. Sold out practice. Just going crazy. And so the energy, <laughs> we we were so tired at that point because we had already just been like going through two weeks of feeling like we were competing at the Olympics mm-hmm. every day. And we're warming up backstage and you can hear the crowd. And every time somebody falls, it's like, ah, la, 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 I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. You know, we didn't have our Beats headphones like every dozen <laughs> hours, just isolated. We were just doing our thing. So then we finally got out there and we had our little, you know, we're standing there like, okay, let's just have fun, let's do it. It's our turn. And guess who had skated it for us? Oh, yeah, the stare down was right <laughs> was before our us. was Margalio and they fell and then she was giving him evils like for, it seemed like 20 minutes oh. that they were standing there staring at each other. You know other. how anxious you are to get on the ice, like, just let me on the ice because I need yeah. to like do a couple laps and I need to, and we were just like, <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> Stop staring at each that other. We didn't understand. We couldn't, we couldn't see them from our line of sight. So all we knew is that we were being like held and we just did not understand what was happening. And yeah. we were standing around for so long. Ugh. And you feel like at fun. that point, and you've competed so many times, you feel like you kind of have your rhythm almost, it seems like it's down to like the second. Like, okay, mm-hmm. I am, I sat for, 
three people and I mm-hmm. stood up and I walked for one and then I stood here and I did my like uh-huh. my like, squats and stuff and now I'm ready to go and then it's like Whoop! and so I think that actually helped us because there was something comical about that experience at that moment of here we go no we don't and now we're waiting and it was it was uh, I think it was it was able to break the tension for us a little yeah. bit I mean there was a lot of tension for them but I don't know, that <laughs> broke for a while but um, then we just went out there and it was it was really fun it mm-hmm. was probably the most most fun thing I've had competing that performance was. yeah. And so funny because when we started the season and Igor brought us that Jennifer Lopez song, we were like, are you kidding? We can't compete seriously. Like with at Jennifer the Olympics. Lopez. That's yeah. yeah, like that's that's not real life. And <laughs> and he really stuck his foot down and we're so glad he did. Yeah. Yeah, that energy that came out. I mean how that too. <laughs> and heading into the free dance, mathematically, there was a chance that you guys could definitely win that title. Was that on your mind at all? Did you think about that? I think that we had um, we had such a great experience in the original dance performing without expectation that um, we really tried as best we could not to put any more pressure on ourselves. Um, having said that, it was really difficult to compete the free dance. Um, I, I always say I, I literally don't think I could have picked my feet up off the ice if not for Ben because you know in in, a, in our partnership at least I can't speak for others but we would kind of always understand who was the one who was more stable in each competition because there was always nerves and you know one would automatically sense that they needed to step up and take the role of being more reassuring and um, I was so shaky and so scared it was one of those experiences you know when you get ready to compete and you're just like I don't, I don't want to do this yeah. like I just like, like you'd I, rather die. Yes, <laughs> yeah. like you're lacing up your skates and you're like, why do I do this to <laughs> yes. myself every time? This is torture. <laughs> I hate my life. We could just go. Yeah, we could just go. Yeah. Everything will be okay. People will understand. We just got to go. And um, and yeah, and Ben was so uh, positive. I just felt like, yeah. And you may very well have been just as nervous as I was. Um, but I was stumbly during that performance. It definitely wasn't our best free dance performance. But considering the circumstances that we were dealing with, I felt like it was still extraordinary um, for us to be able to put it together as well as we did with everything that had happened um, in that year. And so, yeah, and we didn't know that we had come second. I think we had to wait for the French to skate and um, it was a weird, a weird um, scoring flip around. Like I think they yeah. had finished second in the free dance and we had finished fourth, but then we flip flopped in overall standing. So it was a really, really big surprise. Yeah. And it was one we, it literally, I think they were last or it, they were very late. Yeah. Yeah. And so we really were just sitting there like, and we skated fairly early. I mm-hmm. think. You know, it's interesting how you talk about, we could sense who was nervous. And I think the more nervous you get, that like almost relaxes me. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's kind of weird. But it's like I, I, and I think we kind of feed off of that. And so it was like the more nervous you felt, it almost was just like made me feel even calmer, which is, like I think that's seesaw. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, and that, um, what was I going to say about the free dance? With the free dance, it's funny. After we were finished and the next day they said, hey, come on back to the studio and We'd like you to watch your free dance with us and talk us through it. You know, we're like, this is great. We have our medals and we've been up for 48 hours because we were doing media nonstop after that. So we're sitting there watching it and I don't remember if we were, I don't think we were with Bob Costa, somebody else, but one of their main guys. And, and then we're watching it and we were both thinking like, Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it was a little bit painful to watch, especially, I don't know, because the whole experience is so amazing that we're watching we're like, Oh, we could have done better. Yeah. But I, I kind of later on I realized that when you're at a spectacular event, like the Olympics, it's just an unbelievable event, you don't have to do anything more spectacular than what you train every day. And so being able to just go and do your normal thing on a spectacular stage makes it spectacular. And mm-hmm. I think that's what we were able to to accomplish was that and I think that's what tripped up a lot of other people is they were trying to do something they didn't normally do. And it happens, I mean, we've done that too. You know, you go out there and you just, you want to try so hard and then you're not used to that. And especially mm-hmm. with two people, if one person tries a little harder than the other person is expecting it and, um, you know, being able to just 
just do your thing. And Marina was really good about that. She'd always say, just do your job. Yeah. Go do your job. And I was like, yeah. okay, all right, that's easy. And don't wear over the boot tights. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Love that. <laughs> Too many things. Love that. <laughs> She's like, animal hooves. It looks like animal hooves. <laughs> fight over your boots. Smart woman. Yeah. Smart woman. Who wears nude shoes? No one wears nude shoes. <laughs> then it became a fashion trend for 10 right. years. <laughs> well, speaking of free dances, the next fall you debuted a free dance that even Susie Wynn panned on American TV. Oh. So what was responsible for that entertainment and why it's regarded as one of the biggest panned free dances of all time? What happened? Really, oh, we get ranked? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's like getting a Razzie. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lasting uh, mark. <laughs> it's, uh, well, I would imagine, I don't recall specifically the conversations that led to it, but um, we had very limited time because we had done the Champions on Ice tour, which at that time, um, back in the day, was 90 something cities. Um, Four and, and a half months. Yeah. Jen, you were, were you on that tour with us or the no, next? No, the um, one before. So it was the one before, like yeah. Um, and so you know how difficult it is to, to think competitively while you're on a tour like that. I mean, it's, it's night and day. And so we were gone until mid-August. Um, and when we got back, it was just like we had no idea what we were doing competitively. It's not as though we were on a plan and a rhythm like we had in seasons past where you had an inkling of what you might do the following season um, before you even finished the previous one. Um, all we knew was that we were on a high, we wanted to go enjoy it, and we would revisit what we were going to do with our future and frankly whether or not we were going to keep skating at all. Um, which is what we came home to, was a meeting with all of us to say what are we going to do. Um, and at that time, it, for example, it was like the first time that I started getting into broadcasting. Um, and so there were other things that started piquing our interest uh, that were, you know, potentially other pursuits that we could look to beyond skating. And so there was just a lot going on. And um, somewhere in that distracted haze, that's entertainment, <laughs> moved its way forward. <laughs> I think so, the, thought, the thought was like it was a good thing for our personality. Well, yeah, and it started... Because we want to do singing in the rain, like that oh, was where right. it came. we're like, you know what, we right. should do. Like we just, you know, we like to be fun and have light heart. And like I've always loved the movie, and Igor loved the movie. And I was like, so let's do singing in the rain, and that was the original idea. And we needed something lighthearted because it was a very light year for us. Yeah, right. We weren't putting right. any pressure on our future. Yeah. And so we were listening to Singing in the Rain and listening and listening, and all the music just sounded old. It didn't sound big in the rink. And Igor was like, I just don't like the way it sounds. Sounds too old fashioned. And so we were listening and listening and finally, and then somebody came, like, heard the, this, that, inter that's entertainment overture and it had singing in the rain in it. We're like, hey, yeah. but it was full. It had a lot of, like, the sound was really good. And so, okay, well, let's kind of go with this. And then, so as the further along we got, the farther away from our original concept we got. And, and then, I don't think we realized it. Yeah, we didn't realize it until we competed and it was just like, ooh. It was really a, it was also a time crunch, you know. We we had sure. Skate America coming up, and actually I don't even we know if we did Skate, Skate America. America. Yeah, we, China. Yeah, and Russia. Um, but we just we had to make a decision fast, and um, and that's the one that seemed the best at the time. Uh, and even actually, I've talked to several like, judges and officials who came to monitor us before those events, and I asked them, like, why didn't you say anything? Because they'd tell us, like, oof, that was terrible. But, like, you came and said you liked it. And they're like, well, we couldn't tell you no two weeks before your Grand Prix, you know. So it's, I think we kind of all just had to convince ourselves that this was a reasonable vehicle. And then uh, as soon as we finished the Grand Prix and sort of took a, a step back and looked at the competitive landscape, we realized that it was just bad news. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was, hey. it was fine. <laughs> it happened. It, you know, and, and we came out with Amelie because of that, and that was a nice program for us. I mean, it would have been better if we'd had more time to develop it, but I felt like we really, um, for the first time, explored a more lyrical style to our skating, and ultimately, you know, it, it was a huge benefit for us to experience that program. So maybe we had to go through that step to reach the better one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, Amelie was probably one of my favorites. It mm -hmm. just, it, it's funny that you brought that up because recently, I don't, I think we were trying to come up with some ideas for little things we could use for a show program. And I was looking back 
and I found our very first free dance uh, from Junior. And then there was like a link to the next one. I was like, oh, and then the next one, I was like, watched all of ours in a row. <laughs> and then it came to like, that's entertainment. And I was like, oh, oh, it's getting better. Oh, give it. And they're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what happened? And then I saw Alma. And I was like, oh, okay, that's better. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it happens. It I happens. Guess. Yeah. No, it does. Yeah. Nowadays, it gets panned at Chance Camp and then it never sees the light of day. I think we're actually responsible for Chance Camp. <laughs> That's why they, the I think we are camp. why yeah. they require everybody to show their programs at Champs Camp so yeah. that they don't have another that's in a table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bad. Well, that season at Worlds, despite a mishap in the OD, you were still in it entering the free dance. So changing your free dance that season, did you feel like you were able to be fully prepared for those world championships? Um, I feel like physically we were pretty well conditioned. I think artistically the programs, you know, could have benefited from uh, a little more sort of peaceful reflection. There was a, a, a kind of a panic that set in over that season that was hard to rid ourselves of. Um, I remember not necessarily enjoying competing like I had up to that point in that competition just because I, you know, there's nothing worse than going to a competition and feeling underprepared. And although I knew we were physically capable of delivering a good performance, it was just such a scramble that whole season that I didn't feel totally connected and settled with the performance that I was giving. Um, but, you know, I, having said that, there was a huge confidence boost in just shaking things up, you know, and even in dyeing my hair, which was, you know, in large part psychological in essence because we wanted to just kind of like rid ourselves of the bad experience of, of choosing that's entertainment and start over. And so there was some confidence just in feeling renewed and refreshed, but um, a little more time obviously yeah. would, have, would have been more comfortable. I mean, usually programs go through, you know, months and months of evolution and you – you, we, we never competed at Worlds or Nationals with even close to the same program that we started. I mean, the music and the concept was the same. Very often the costumes were different. Mm -hmm. A lot of the content had grown and been changed and tweaked. And um, Igor was always like finding little ways to make some adjustments and to uh, maybe even notorious, you know, for making little adjustments all the way through the season. And that's what really made the program special. And and so um, just so well defined by the end of the season. So, of mm -hmm. course, if that if Amelie had had a long time, it could have even been better. But I think, <laughs> especially considering the circumstances, it turned out pretty well. Yeah. Well, the following year, once Domita and Shavelin withdrew from Worlds, you were the clear favorites, and all the expectations were that you would win. How much pressure did you feel going into that event? I think we felt um, a lot of responsibility to fulfill that expectation, um, especially since we really felt capable, mm -hmm. um, more so that year than any other. We felt like we were more mature and more prepared. We had uh, a really great free dance with Chopin that we felt great about. And um, yeah, there was a lot of expectation that we placed on ourselves to, yeah. to, to rise to that occasion. And we weren't nervous about it. Um, whether or not that was part of the reason why, you know, I took a tumble and and took ourselves out of the mix, um, I don't really know. But, but yeah, it was, it felt right, and you know, I can't say that I felt any. It just was like what happened. I, you know, I don't know. I was just like sitting on the ice. I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then we finish, and obviously an ice dance, particularly at that time. You had there was no way you were coming back after a fall. There was no way you could make it back to the top if you sat down in, in one of the three components. So, um, you know, it it disappeared quickly. But I still felt very accomplished that season because I felt like we had taken great strides in our skating and as um, you know, it sounds silly, but as artists, <laughs> I felt like we had yeah. evolved. You know, um, to be able to take on more concepts and 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 enjoy our skating even more, and um, so yeah, so that that was disappointing. But everyone, I feel like everyone has that story. You know, where it was dangling right in front of them, and they just just couldn't grab it. Yeah, and like Tana said, as artists, I mean, that was kind of the first time that we'd worked with um, we worked with a contemporary dance choreographer. Well, 
he was he's a dance choreographer, not not especially his contemporary, but we we worked with dance choreographers. We went to LA and we kind of had this boot camp of contemporary mm -hmm. dance and really kind of experimenting with other forms of movement and other choreography and um, it worked really well with Igor and just that whole we had the music orchestrated by a composer here in, in Detroit and it was it was like a really cool experience that whole season mm -hmm. preparing for it and like Tana said we just we felt so ready I mean yeah even especially in the compulsory which normally was like uh Dread the compulsory, dig ourselves a hole, we got to climb out of it with the OD and then try to, you know, get up there on the free dance. And, like, we felt so confident with all of that. So, I mean, it just happens. Yeah. Igor, I remember when we finished, um, you know, there was no consoling us. I mean, we were just shocked. There was nothing to do. And we had to snap out of it to compete the next day. And I remember Igor saying, like, you know, um, he called me in my room that night and he was like, you know, you need to come down to the lobby and meet me. Like, we need to talk. And so I was expecting this, like, the pep talk of my life to turn it around, but I didn't know if I was ready to hear it. And he just took me to the bar and was like, you need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was probably the best thing you could have done for me. So you and I had a good drink and had a good sleep and turned it around the next day. Yeah. So that's probably the only time that he's ever ever done that with a student but there was no there was nothing else to say you know there was nothing to change we were already prepared we were already skating well it just happened and you know that's that so it's too bad that uh, obviously that it happened uh, when we had our best shot at winning world title but it's not surprising that it happened sure. then either well, by that time, it appeared that Virtue and Moyer and Davis and White had had so much buzz and that Virtue and Moyer were kind of Marina's dream team of sorts. So did it become too crowded in Canton at that time for you? I don't think, well, we were so used to yeah. it. I mean, we literally loved that environment. Like that yeah. was just, it was such a great group of skaters to train with and like every day, you know, Everybody was good friends and, you know, it seems like it would be full of drama, but at that time it really wasn't. And it was like, yeah. we, we were all on a softball team together. You right know, sometimes me, in like... terms of dynamics in the social cliques of the ring, sometimes you just like, you get this great group, like this, this unstoppable core group of friends. And, uh, you know, it's where I, it's where Meryl and I became friends. It's where, you know, uh, um, our best friends, Lauren and Brooke, where we all became friends. It's where everything in terms of my continued social life established itself, including my relationship with Charlie. Everything happened during that, you know, those incredible years in Canton. And um, we loved it, you know. It was, it was so much fun those yeah. few years. I mean, those are the, probably the happiest years of my training I'd ever had. But in terms of our skating, it just felt like, Although all of those things were in line and we were really happy with our training environment, we weren't happy with what we were producing and, um, and we didn't know how to accomplish that. And so we came to the conclusion that maybe we needed to go somewhere else to be forced to think more outside the box of how we could, how we could accomplish that. But in terms of the, um, the competition within the rink and, um, and anything to those, um, to those thoughts, we really didn't feel like we had to compete for attention from Marina or from mm -hmm. Igor. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, for the same reason why those two teams were able to continue to train together for so many years after that. They were very conscientious of making sure that everyone felt prioritized. And and even up to the day that we left Igor and Marina, they were very, con you know, considerate of, um, of what we wanted to accomplish and how they could help us do that. And unfortunately, in that case, we decided that it meant that we needed to make a change. But, uh, you know, our relationship with them has has turned into a nice friendship that we can, you know, we all understand. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to make a change. Yeah, and I mean, it was, it was a kind of feeling for us that our skating had just kind of plateaued. Like, yeah. It was like, better, 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 better. And then we just felt like we weren't continuing to improve. Yeah. And nobody knew why. Like, we, you know, no. we talked to them about it and it was like, felt like we had reached a point where, okay, we need to try something else. And Yeah, and we I really, really didn't yeah, know. Yeah. And looking back, I think that was such a good decision for us because then the next chapter was equally full of, like, 
learning. Like just mm-hmm. felt like all of a sudden, oh, I'm learning new stuff. And it was very exciting and, and refreshing from that perspective of, you know, somebody else is doing things differently. And it's like every day is uh, a, a new experience. And so that mm-hmm. was really, uh, I think, very important for us in those last couple of years uh, of our career. Well, when you left Marina, told Ice Network that she felt that you had gotten complacent after the Olympics. So do you feel that was a true statement? I think, uh, I don't know if complacent would be the term that we would use to describe our state of mind, but as Ben said, we did feel like we, as a couple, had uh, had lost a bit of, of uh, focus on what we were trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, I can understand how she could interpret it that way because we felt so disconnected from what we were doing, you know? And so, um, whereas previous years we were very clear on our ambitions and our artistic ambitions and what we felt uh, in terms of ground we still needed to cover, what we needed to do each season, and we just felt like we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to do to take the next step in our skating career, to evolve as a couple whom people had grown accustomed to seeing for so many years and we really felt pressured to be seen in a new light to keep things interesting and to keep us worth considering as a top couple. And so, and so, yeah, I think mentally we hadn't become complacent, but we had become disconnected mm-hmm. from, um, from our, our, you know, our, our purpose or just our development. We just didn't know, we just didn't know what to do. And so we were a bit, um, yeah, a bit lost. Yeah, lost is the word that popped into my head. Yeah, we were lost. And so, you know, you can imagine how that could be interpreted any different way from the outside. Um, and perhaps we weren't communicating well. You know, not knowing not knowing what to point a finger at, I think we just sort of stewed, you know, <laughs> in our own um, concerns and maybe didn't communicate well with them at that time. Well, the next season when Ben had a back injury... You spent a lot of time working on your skating with Gennady, and your lines and your strength improved immensely when you Thank had you. moved. And you had addressed uh, concerns that you felt that you had been the weaker partner. So what did you work on to improve? Uh, yeah, well, Natalia and Gennady had a lot of basic skating exercises, a lot of basic strength exercises that they were very, very um, insistent be the base of any couple. You know, um, when we first came to them, they were uh, very disappointed in our basic skating ability, and that was something that they focused on uh, relentlessly mm-hmm. um, and continued to do so when, when Ben's injury struck. Um, but, but yeah, I, had, I absolutely felt uh, very weak in terms of, you know, if I were on a practice at a competition, I would never go out and just stroke on my own because I felt it would expose me too much. And uh, I, I had decided in my own mind that, um, you know, I had my, my skating skills had their merits, but it, it, you know, it wasn't about my fundamental skating skills. I could compensate, essentially, in other ways. Um, and they convinced me that I had the, uh, the ability to take that further and to develop, you know, the underdeveloped parts of my skating. And, uh, and yeah, it was just a lot of strength training on the ice and their commitment to not get distracted by the pressures of um, upcoming competitions and focusing on, on the programs too much. And, and, you know, that was hard too that first year. Um, we even, we had to call, um, you know, some of our mentors and officials and things like that that year at U.S. Figure mm-hmm. Skating and ask them to to kind of team up with us and help us because we were, I think, five weeks out of Skate America and we didn't have a free dance. Because Natalia was like, "You're not ready. You're not ready. You can't. You can't skate. So you can't have a free dance." And we're like, "What? We really need to train." And she just would. She was just like, "Hockey pucks. Get your hockey pucks." And we're like, "We don't need hockey pucks. We need a free dance." And she just she and thank God, thank God she did that because we were able to develop strengths that we didn't think we could develop at that late stage in our careers, and it gave us the confidence that we needed to really enjoy our last few years of skating. Um, and, and we did, and we really felt great about that. How would you compare the technique of Natalia's teams to that of the teams at Training Canton at that time? Uh, equally strong, and uh, like anything, like jumps, like any, anything in skating, uh, very different. 
even in terms of just leaning into the circle or leaning out of the circle. It seemed like everything that we had known, they had uh, a different idea about. Yeah. And uh, it's obvious based upon the quality of skating that Igor and Marina uh, have both produced with their teams that there's nothing lacking in their technique. But for us at that time, we needed, we felt like we needed some, something new to, to refocus our energy on. And, and yeah, they were much, I, I would say Natalia is uh, like, she's really invested in just like sustaining the long edges and the really glide. the glide and the flow and pressing into the ice. And, you know, her choreography, we would say like, we need to push or we need, this is uncomfortable. And she would leave it in because of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, watching back some of those programs, it's tough because we feel like, oof, that move never came through. Like it just never got better. We really were hoping it would come through, but she left it in there because she was insistent that it be a tool that we use to challenge ourselves to become better skaters to the point where we could master it. Um, and so for us, that was a different take. Um, you know, instead of trying to find different ways to go about it, she would just stick her heel in the mud and just say, this is the only way to go. She didn't want to give us more steps to get speed for this element because she wanted us to learn how to use those two crossovers to get all the speed we needed. Yeah. So it was and really it was, I mean, it was tough yeah. in the landscape of dance at the time, which had become so dynamic and aggressive mm -hmm. and exciting and, you know, to have... Um, to have Ave Maria, you know, it felt um, almost, I think, dated uh, in comparison um, because she wanted to demonstrate the core of great dancing, skating skill ability, you know, and, um, and the other couples like Tess and Scott and Marilyn Charlie were just like, they were just flying around us. And, um, you know, it was just a different, it was just a different time. Yeah. We saw such improvements in your skating, yet the re results didn't reflect that internationally. Do you think it was the program choices that you had? To what do you attribute that drop in the ranks a little bit? Well, you know, I think that once, once you kind of lose your momentum, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get it back. And I mean, it, 2007 could be, say, you could say that, you know, the writing was on the wall. I mean, those guys were they were spectacular. They are spectacular, right? And they were coming into their own and they were getting the confidence and establishing themselves as like the next yeah. champions. And there's no, there was no denying that. No, it was going to happen. It was, was going to happen. happen this year or the next year. They, <laughs> those two teams were going to take over and everyone knew it. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah. I think for us, our, I, I always, um, I always kind of, I think people are surprised because when I, I talk about my favorite performance, and what I think was our best performance, I feel like our Olympic free dance in 2010 yeah. was the best performance that we ever skated. Mm -hmm. Because it was probably, I think for me, it was the only time in our entire competitive, uh, com our competitive life that we went out and we competed the program exactly how we felt like we knew that we could and how we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And how we knew we had trained it and, and there was no little there was no little bobble there was no hiccup there was no oh well there was that one spot where it mm -hmm. felt a little out of position it just felt like everything was perfect <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. and it was an amazing feeling it was something that i had never felt before yeah and knowing that that was our last competitive skate it was um it was very moving it was emotional and it was it was magical for it was like uh, a healing experience because, you know, when when you work so hard and you don't feel like you're getting where you want to be and you don't, and then it, maybe you have the su success in the event, but then you don't feel like you actually skated your best. Yeah. Um, it was it was a moment, a cathartic moment where I was like, man, everything came together. And, and it was worth it. And yeah. it didn't matter. Like, I didn't care that we were not on the podium. I was like, congratulations to these guys. That was amazing. Like, I... I did such a good job. Like I was yeah, so personal. happy and proud of us, especially coming back through the the, the difficulty of injury and and moving and, and a lot of things. It felt like we really redeemed yeah. ourselves for ourselves. Yeah, and and you know, of the two of us, um, you know, Ben is far more likely in a competitive setting to be the one to find the glass half full. You know, yeah. and that was the 
the only time in my career where I was right there with you. Like mm. the results felt amazing. Uh, the skating was better than we performed in 2006. And so feeling that in our, in our bodies and in our hearts, we really kind of felt like, well, you know, this crazy world of skating, what can we say? You know, yeah. we felt like we were better then than we, better now than we were then. And we had all our highest results there. And so it only goes to show that you just only have control over so much. And I know these are cliched figure skating statements, but they very much felt um, true more than any other time in our career in that moment was that we had done everything we could. And actually, it was the only time we weren't nervous to compete as well. Um, waiting backstage to compete for the free dance. We, we were just sitting together just like with these huge grins on our faces because we were ready for the skate and we knew it would be our last skate um, and we just knew it was going to be good. We just yeah. felt so accomplished at that point because we had, um, we had met so many of the goals that we set out to for years and we were able to, to really put them together and feel satisfied. Um, Around that time, oh, I'm sorry. I was Go just going to say, and then I hadn't, I personally hadn't watched Charlie Merrill or Tessa and Scott skate probably since 2007. Because when we're at competition, like I never watch anybody. I was like, you know, it's in the zone, just thinking about focusing on what I need to do. And um, I mean, later on, watching their program, like, oh my God, they're amazing. Like, amazing. Of course they were going to yeah. beat us. Like, <laughs> it's insanity. But, um, you know, at that moment, I I really felt that what we were doing was the best that we could possibly do, yeah. and it was at that at for yeah. that time that was a, absolutely the best we could have been doing. Yeah, and it felt so good. To and I think those deliver. programs, those programs um, showed our newfound strengths very well, mm. and and that was what we really felt most confident in showing in that moment. So I think the program's choreography was was amazing and great for us and we felt very very happy with the way we were able to do it well in subsequent articles around that time it was discussed that natalia actually told you tanith to gain weight and this is something that's not said very often in skating and then you wound up discussing this in the new york times and subsequently on twitter you talked about using your experiences to improve the self-image of your skaters so how much of an impact did body image disorder eating etc have on your career a uh, huge impact, huge. Um, you know, like like many skaters, unfortunately, it. it I, I mean, it plagued me for the better part of ten years, to be certain. Um, to your first point, yeah. When I arrived, Natalia said that uh, her mission was to improve our strength, and if you want to become a stronger skater, you need more muscle development, and you can't do that when you're not feeding your body enough there's nothing to turn into muscle. It's impossible. And, uh, and I remember Gennady telling, telling us that all the girls that they would train, he would tell them like, I'm, I'm going to tell you, your jeans aren't going to fit in a couple months. And I'd be like, oh, because you're going to be so skinny. And she was like, no, because your muscles are going to be bigger and they're not going to fit. And that was like horrifying for me at the time, the, the image of that. And sure enough, I remember when we came in, I was like, my jeans don't fit over my thighs anymore. And because... Yes, because I felt so empowered with that newfound strength, um, to my great surprise, it was something that I felt was a huge accomplishment. Um, and to be able to value uh, strengthening my body in that way versus valuing what I perceived as the most appropriate aesthetic um, was a really important shift and very much so the catalyst to me regaining control, or rather control is probably the worst turn, but regaining uh, a positive perspective on, uh, on how I looked and how I felt and what, what was the way that I wanted to feel and, and the best feeling I could have for myself. Um, as far as the, the comments that were released in the New York Times, that was actually, um, and I'm glad you brought it up, and it's not something that I, I mind talking about um, now, but that interview was done in the summer before the Olympics. So she came in June or July, I believe, and then um, held the story until while we were at the Olympic Games. And I was really disappointed because I felt, and whether or not this was the case of how people saw it, but I felt like it seemed like an attention-grabbing, opportunistic moment 
um, but it could be perceived as though I released some comments that were sensational that, um, you know, do you know what I mean? I just thought that releasing it at that time and people saying, why is she talking about this right now? You know, it, it seemed like it, with the timing of the way it came out, that it was a way for me to try and get attention. And I thought the article was a, a training, you know, a, a training period article from the summer before the Olympics. And so it was kind of surprising to me at that time. To me, that was a long time ago in my mind. It was six, seven months ago. And um, it was distracting in, you know, in reality to kind of be like, whoa, what is this article? And everyone's asking me about my weight and I'm thinking about competing. Um, so I think that you know, obviously they held the story for when it would be most relevant when we were in the press, and I completely understand. But it definitely made me feel um, conservative with how and when I spoke in the future about that issue because I never wanted to bring anything up to that effect and have it be the end of the conversation. That just seemed like meaningless in, in the grand scheme of things. So, uh, so yeah, so that was kind of the end of it for me because I thought, well, I don't want to be some kind of quote that that doesn't help anyone, you know, that, that, that's not me using a platform to make a difference. That's just a quote that has, you know, no connection to anyone else. And, and, um, so that was, that was kind of my experience in, in terms of, of, of the publicity on that subject. And it wasn't a positive one. Well, talking about publicity on subjects, after the Olympics, you came out publicly with your relationship with Charlie White. So why did you wait until after the Olympics to come forward with your relationship, and how did you and he team up off the ice? Um, so by the time we went to Vancouver, uh, we had been dating for about a little less than a year, I guess. We got together um, the summer of 2009. So we were pretty comfortable with our relationship. It was obviously well known to to Ben and to Meryl and to our close friends and family. Um, not known to my coaches. I didn't tell them. <laughs> I didn't know how that was going to go over. So I never told Natalia. Um, but but yeah, you know, it 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 was definitely sensitive to discuss. Um, you know, I remember telling Ben, I think we were just like skating around the mm -hmm. rink and I was just like, so I'm, I think I'm dating Charlie. <laughs> and, um, and I remember Ben was like, oh, that's so cute. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was so excited. Was like, I love Charlie I am, too. <laughs> he, was, he was great. He was on board 100% right away. He yeah. thought it was great. Um, but we were very aware of, um, of navigating that sensitively and wisely. Um, we didn't necessarily have like a, um, a long discussion or a meeting between all of us about how we wanted to present it. It was pretty understood that it it wasn't necessary to discuss it publicly, and by no means did we want that to get attention over um, all of our skating and and what we were really there at the Olympics for. And so we wanted to make sure that that was pretty quiet in terms of press. But even you know at the U.S. Championships before the Olympic Games. Um, we weren't going out of our way to be secretive about spending time with each other. It just wasn't something that we needed to publicize, we felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, after I retired in 2010, there was no obstacle to keep us from discussing it. So that was very uh, relieving. It was, it was nice. <laughs> I could tear up my non-disclosure agreement. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, at that time, I remember everyone joking because it was reminiscent of the scene in The Cutting Edge. So how nervous were you to tell Ben and to tell Meryl at that time about what was going on? Um, nervous, yeah. I was pretty nervous to tell everyone, really. I mean, I was even nervous to tell my parents because everyone that I knew who was important to me knew Charlie and in all likelihood were close to him, too. So it was more complicated than just saying, you know, I'm dating so-and-so and you don't know who they are. Everyone that I talked to um, was part of our core group already. So it was more impactful because in a way it could impact their relationship with us respectively as well. Um, but yeah, I wasn't nervous um, to tell those closest to me um, because they wouldn't be close to me if I didn't feel like I could trust them um, and trust them to support me um, and make good decisions. So. So yeah, um, I wasn't nervous to tell Ben, um, and I waited until I could see Meryl in person to talk to her. Um, and it was hard only in that we hadn't had much time to catch up because I'd already moved away. By the time Charlie and I started dating, um, we hadn't been living in Michigan for over a year. 
Um, and so, you know, there's so much that you want to just come home and visit and just catch up and have fun. And then in the middle of that, you got to just drop this bomb about like, oh, yeah, <laughs> by the way, I'm dating your partner. Uh, where do you drop a bomb like that? Where? Yeah. <laughs> we were at, uh, we were at our, our best friend uh, Brooke's house, Brooke Castile then, um, I think for her birthday or someone's birthday party. And we were just having like a slumber party. And, uh, and you know, you can't keep something like that a secret from a friend. They, they care about you and they want to know everything that's going on in your life. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, we did it in person, the same way I did it with Ben. And, um, and so, yeah, so we were all sitting around together and, um, and that way we could talk it out about like, how does this affect us and how do we deal with this moving forward? And that was something Charlie and I had to figure out too. You know, we didn't even know if we were allowed to tell each other what we were skating to, you know, like we would talk every day in like cryptic codes about like, <laughs> how was your day? It was good. It was good. Like how's training? I don't know. How's your training? It's fine. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, it, it was weird for a while because we really, we knew how secretive the ice dance game can be. Um, in terms of the timing of when you release things and, and, you know, that was, that was tricky. And so we just all decided, let's keep our relationships separate from skating, which is healthy anyway, you know, as much as we could. And that, that was how we kind of navigated that. Well, at the 2009 Worlds, you skated extremely well and you had the emotional reaction like you thought you might have won. And also that's when Meryl and Charlie had their breakout performance and Domnina and Shabalin did not but they won. So how much, how confident did you feel about your potential for the Olympics? And it seemed like it was a very interesting time. So where was your head at that summer before the Olympics? After 2009? I mean, yeah. 2009 in itself was just such a roller coaster ride. I mean, mm -hmm. we were in a new place and we were really energized and we were training hard. And then the injury was, my back injury was so seemingly catastrophic I mean, mm -hmm. there was, I never had a point where I felt like, oh my gosh, my career's over. But looking back, like that's the kind of injury that ends people's careers. And I was very lucky to have a great team that was able to, I was able to get back and, and even be at, at the world championships then. So I kind of felt, I think I felt like we had gotten over such a big hump with 2009 that in 2010, it was just like, let's keep go doing what we had been doing before 2009 was so thrown into chaos. And I think that we were able to continue with the work that Natalia and Gennady were, were doing on our skating. And that was that always just seemed like it was front and center. Like, okay, go do forward stroking. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> left, right. That was every day. Gennady yeah. says, okay, main step, go. The, the last day we trained before we left for the Olympics was like, okay, let's work on stroking. And it was just this um, this project that, okay, if maybe we'd had like another five years, they would have been kind of happy with how that had gone, but it was just this, this never-ending project that we have to keep working on this. And everything else, to a very small degree, was not as important, I think. You know yeah. what I mean? The, the, the programs were important, all the lifts and everything that came together, that's obviously extremely important, but it still seemed like there was this huge job that we had to do. Mm -hmm. and, and they never felt like we tapped into our potential um, com as completely as we could have. Yeah. I remember at, in Vancouver, we went through the press line and we came and found Natalia and, um, and she was like, babies, worlds. And we were like, no way, no way. She was like, world championships, you can, you can do, you can do. And we were like, Natalia, please, no. We're done. Yeah, yeah we're, we're so done. And even, I mean, up... Up until like I think last year, every year we go to nationals for some reason or another, and we see her, and she steps back and assesses us, and she's like, "You can still go, you can still go." And we're like, no, looks, looks well, looks, looks well. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every day was it's close to well, but, but not, not enough. enough. <laughs> every day, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. We gotta do it. We gotta do more. Keep working. <laughs> Right, so we need to talk it out because one of the memorable things about the Olympic season was the Aboriginal original dance. And you obviously got to see it before the rest of the world. I'll never forget seeing it for the first time in the brown face when the, when the and Shabalin first performed it. So having been in their training camp, what was your reaction to this program? I think that um, in, in having been around while it was developing, 
it was um, it was a different experience for us um, because it came together gradually and the music changed here and there and um, you know and we had so much on our own plates we weren't paying super close attention um, you know like, I, I that's weird music yeah I remember when Natalia she was playing it she asked us and we were like this isn't music this is not music <laughs> and she was like it is babies it is it is music this is going to be the Russians program we were just yeah we were just, okay. That's okay. I mean, thank you. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's fine. I mean, uh, but yeah, having seen it in development, it, it didn't have the impact on us as it might have if you were seeing it for the first time, completely unbeknownst, uh, yeah. you know, to what had been going on in training. But um, we also didn't see, you know, didn't without the costumes, costumes and yeah. everything. Um, it was very different. And to be frank, their ability to train during that time with his injury was very limited. And so we didn't really see run throughs or, or much, you know, he was in and out and he could only do small parts. And so we didn't get the full impression. Um, I, I don't even think we competed with them that year, really. Oh, no, yeah. Until, until, we, until we were there. Yeah. And we didn't watch them when we were there. Yeah. Well, you talk about Max's knee injury and they had the belts on their costume, which received some criticism because they thought it may have help them. Now watching them in practice, how much do you think that did aid them in competition? Did they need that? Did you feel? I don't think they needed it. No. You know, um, despite his limitations in terms of um, a lot of the tricks and things like that, you know, they were still a very beautiful team, obviously very accomplished and still had a lot to offer. Um, you know, but it may be in the same way that we felt like we had to move and shake things up. Maybe they felt like they had to have something up their sleeve to to gain attention, to be seen as a standout in some way um, from the other couples. But I, I don't think they needed it to to no, show I mean, a good it's not like it's not like he was a cripple. He just he couldn't like he couldn't lunge. Like he just couldn't bend his knee past a certain point. Yeah. Um, with any weight on it, and so, I mean. Clearly, it's not like he had one arm or something. Like he was, he could have lifted her another way. Uh, I think that was just there, you know, uh, trying to be clever, and mm -hmm. it wasn't against the rules then. So you yeah. know, it's just how can we be unique, unique in some way yeah. and stand out? And I mean, the the year before in two thousand nine, we had that Lies of an Ellie program. Um, Gennady really wanted us to look into somehow getting some kind of like firework explosive thing that came off of the backs of our skates for real. Like, he said, you know, like little fireworks off the back of your skate, like tap, tap, tap. Pew, pew, pew. And we were like, you can't do that. And he said, show me the rule that says you cannot have pyrotechnics in your skate. And so the rule doesn't exist. And so I feel like they were already of that mentality, like show me the rule that says I can't Let's use a push belt. push that limit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said guys, we'll go, we'll do it for a competition, then they'll make a rule, then you won't be able to do it anymore, but for that one competition, boy, you'll get the publicity, yeah. And, yeah, so they, they always were trying to push the boundaries, yeah. um, and we need people like that. <laughs> I mean, let's try it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, it certainly got people talking, so. I mean, can you imagine how awesome it would be if somebody's doing their side-by-side -side footwork and all of a sudden their skates are like, there's fire coming out of your blade? <laughs> That'd be amazing. That'd be very, <laughs> cool. very cool. Exciting. Well, you were known for having very elegant, pretty costumes throughout your career. And Ave Maria started out very nice. You were in like First Communion white. Ben was in this really rich, beautiful blue. And then it looked like Las Vegas just exploded over Ave Maria at Nationals. And your OG had jingling yeah. and jangling. I was, I was like the ghost of Elvis Presley. <laughs> Defend those fashion choices. What the heck happened? Do I have to? <laughs> yes, you need to know what happened. <laughs> um, you know, it was another, uh, it was another kind of all in moment of, you know, our experience with our what coaches, <laughs> sorry, what was the vision for Ave Maria at that point? Um, well, I think it was Natalia's vision, first of all, and she was the one who introduced us to the designer and, and, um, the costume maker who made those outfits for us. And, you know, our whole program was her artistic vision. And so it didn't seem right to suddenly question her, you know. And that was something that we maintained throughout all of our careers with our coaches was you either trust them to guide you correctly and go all in with everything they ask or, you know, as soon as you start doubting if your coaches are leading you in the right direction, it sets you up for a very unstable mindset for training. And, um, 
and yeah, I think at that point we just felt like whatever you say, whatever you think we need to do, let's do it. And in that, I don't regret it because yeah. it was necessary for us to perform the program to feel like we collectively had come with this product that we all were on board with. Um, obviously, in retrospect, it's not a costume that I think that you I know. particularly enjoy looking at pictures of. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's it's important because when we were with Igor and Marina, especially I think near the end of our relationship as their students, I think we started to feel like we were at looking back on that experience and when we were thinking about what, what who, who could we take from, I mean, who, who is this? A very short list. And I think we really wanted to make sure that we didn't, we felt like maybe we started trying to just do our own thing too much and and not listening to them the way we could have or we used to, you know, mm -hmm. and like feeling like, hey, we're like, we're hot stuff now. We know I don't want to wear that. I want to wear black. You know, like just kind of starting to make mm -hmm. make your too many of your own decisions when you really should be trusting coach. Mm -hmm. your coach who really knows their stuff. And so that was really important to us that we had made – this big move, you know, we left arguably, you know, obviously at that point the best coaches in the world and we went somewhere else because we felt that was going to be what we needed and that they had what we needed and so we were really, we were like Tansa, we were all in, we wanted to do whatever they told us. If they said you need to wear a pineapple on your mm -hmm. head, yeah. it's like okay. I'm going to wear that pineapple yeah. and I'm going to oh, wear it. Yeah. Although so I'd like well. to think if we had been given the other original dance, we would have had we would have had second thoughts. Right, okay, maybe yeah, in our original costume we would have, <laughs> we would have drawn the line somewhere. You know, Ave Maria was not, you know, it, it didn't cross offensive. that line. Was, yeah. yeah. It was just avant-garde. Yeah, those costumes were <laughs> something else. And really expensive. I mean, my mom had made all pretty much all of my costumes up to that point. So just to like Stick it a little <laughs> more. They were like thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Well, that season, you did get off to a strong start winning your Grand Prix. And then going into the final, there was a lot of talk that you would lose to Marilyn Charlie and that would finish you politically for nationals in the Olympics. And then you pulled out of the Grand Prix final with a wisdom tooth surgery. And I'm not really a skeptical person ever, but I may have had a little bit of skepticism about us. So walk us through the wisdom tooth ordeal. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. Uh, well, okay. I'll tell you something factual. I have a really hard time with my dental health. It, it, it really, I do have a, an a, a obscene number of root canals. I don't know why I have such horrible teeth, but I'm sure I'll have like ridiculous veneers in years to come. So at least I can defend that. I have really bad dental health apparently. Um, and uh, I needed to get my wisdom teeth out. At some point, like we all do, you know. And so I had gone to uh, to see a dentist about some irritation, like some throbbing, and I didn't. I thought it was a cavity, and um, he said, "Well, your wisdom tooth is probably infected, you know, and it can get infected. And if you're over in another country and this becomes, you know, a bigger problem and gets excruciating, you're going to have to have surgery immediately to remove the tooth, and um, you know, and so." That was a real thing. I did go in and have dental surgery, um, you know, but the timing of it, obviously, it was a choice that we made. I can go and risk it, you know, and most assuredly, we probably could have gone, but the dentist said, hey, I'm recommending that you do this right now. And so we said, perfect, because <laughs> we really don't want to go to Grand Prix Final right now. I mean, that's the truth. We, we didn't feel great about where we were. And, but, you know, the issue was legit. The surgery happened. What else can I say? You and then know? At the, by the same standpoint, you had to recover after. There was a period of time after. So it was like better to take that earlier and have more time after yeah. to prepare for nationals than yeah. push our training back. Yeah. Before national. I mean, even Charlie, I told him, like, I'm going in for dental surgery. And he was like, you're actually getting dental surgery? <laughs> like, he, he was even skeptical about it. I'm like, no, I really am going to do this. I really am. Um, so, yeah, you know, obviously it's pretty ridiculous that that's on, that's on our resume is that, like, withdrew due to dental surgery. Um, but eh, it worked out okay for us in the end. My teeth are doing quite well, in case anyone's wondering. I have no... No lingering issues with my yeah. wisdom teeth, so 
Crisis averted. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the Russians back in the mix right before the Olympics and your coach coaching both you and Domina and Shavalin, how much of a chance did you think you had to medal at those Olympic Games? Yeah, good. We, were, yeah. we were very confident. I mean, um, it's funny because we skated with them every day and we saw every day that he couldn't bend his knee. Like, that made me feel pretty confident. I was like... <laughs> He can't bend his knee. That's good for me. And, and I've, we've really felt good about our skating. We felt amazing about the, the progress we were making with our, just our skating, our technique, and our glide, and our extensions. And, and we really, um, I mean, we were very confident, and we felt like this was the best that we were skating, that we had been skating maybe ever. And so, yeah, no, we were very confident, and... Um, it wasn't something we were like really concerned about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I think it's, you know, it's important to note that we had already, um, we had already stepped below Maryland Charlie nationally, you know, they had very clearly risen above us. And so we, we already had to shift our, um, our focus in terms of making sure that we weren't looking at results to inspire us, you know, because we had just lost, uh, you know, we had to withdraw from nationals the year before. And then, you know, we came second for the first time. You know, it already was like a, you know, a, a moment of, okay, this is happening. Things are changing. We need to make sure that we're still doing this for reasons that inspire and motivate us. And um, so it, it, that probably also allowed us to skate really well at, in Vancouver because we had to focus on, skating what, how we could for each other and finding the joy in that and the satisfaction mm. beyond the results because that was already a reality for us. Well, after the 2012 World Championships, Marina and Igor infamously split. And having trained with both of them, how would you compare the strength of the two coaches? Wow. Yeah, that's a complex question. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> All the time you need. <laughs> well, I think that we can only speak from we can only speak from our experience, um, which is exclusive to the time when they were together. You know, we weren't um, we weren't taking from them when when they um, had their falling out. So, um, in in terms of our dynamic with them, um, you know, Igor for us was uh, more of the technician. For our earlier years, he was our primary choreographer. Um, I think starting in particular with Chopin, um, Marina became um, a much larger presence in terms of our choreography. But uh, it, it, from the basic, like the setting, she was always the like, styling and um, finding the artistic inspiration and telling the story. Um, but in terms of setting the steps, generally Igor set the steps, um, you know, and then... Um, so for us, he was always our technician. You know, he worked on our compulsory dances. He worked on our step sequences. And of course, he had comments and ideas about how the choreography should be. But it was important for them to divvy up their roles so that it, there, it wasn't redundant in what they were coaching. So he was our technician. Marina was um, sort of the artistic guru um, with her knowledge and history of art history and dance and everything. She could draw from any, you know, classic music or art or ballet and explain to us the, you know, the complexities of the emotion and help us understand how to convey that through our movement. Um, and so that's, from our perspective, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's really yeah. and, and strength. It seems like Igor is a genius for coming up with really in innovative movements and, and holds and and down to like the micro detail of like what is the step and what is this cool move and then marina seemed like she was equally genius in what is the big picture and how yeah. how is this going to impact the audience and yeah. you know if we do something like this it's going to have this it'll it'll bring this emotion out and so i think when they worked together like that it was just dream team yeah, yeah. it was literally <laughs> dream team where yeah. I mean, she could she could help come up craft this this master vision, and then he yeah. could make just the most intricate and interesting things come yeah. to life. 
And I mean, so it was, it was a lot of back and forth too. You know, we would, we would spend an hour working with Igor and making up choreography. And then, you know, she would always have her peripheral and everything that's going on. And then we would come to Marina and, um, you know, we would show her and she would say, great, but maybe a little bit like this and maybe extend this leg and maybe change this hold. And then in the end, look more in here and then kind of how, how are you going to tell the story? And yeah. Um, Definitely. From the emotional standpoint. Yeah. I mean, everyone can see their work. They they yeah. they can see what they're so great at. <laughs> but but we were very lucky, you know, that we got both. <laughs> well, they are known both known for being chess masters and very strong politically. So if they played chess with each other, who would win? Wow. I don't think either yeah. of them have time. Yeah. They don't have time to play chess. They they would just be like, I don't have time for this. I don't. Are you kidding? I have lessons all day. And, yeah. And I have to go to eighteen competitions tomorrow. So. Yeah. No. Put heads in the ring when they work together because they are both such strong personalities and artistic types. What was the question? Sorry, we didn't hear you. Oh, <laughs> I said, would they butt heads in the ring? Not when we were no, there. We never saw that. Um, I mean, they always seem to. Communicate well. Uh, Marina's like the schedule master. I don't know how she does it. You know, she would just have like this ridiculous schedule of all the teams and how they're going yeah. to train. And um, I mean, yeah. and like I said, the the roles and responsibilities were very clearly defined. Mm-hmm. Marina did the schedule. She she did our periodization. You know, she set when when we train, how we train, how much. And, um, you know, and for us, Igor was our technician and our choreographer and, and, you know, and then Marina would come in and give her artistic vision to the program and edit and, and enhance. Um, so yeah, we never felt any, any conflict because we weren't looking to them for the same things. Well, our final question is that we are obsessed with both of your acting abilities on the ice and our favorite program is your bleeding love. So can you walk us through the beginning? Uh, well, we're far apart. You know what's funny is that obviously we have, so Ben basically gives me a letter that he's breaking up with me. And, um, at least know, it's not a text message. Yeah. That's right. It's old classy. School. He's a classy. 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 Yeah. Um, and then when we would tour, he would give the paper to like any random guy on the cast and they for them to write whatever they wanted on the piece of paper and then give it to me. And so every night I would open the paper and, you know, it would be some kind of like inappropriately obscene picture. And I'd have to be like, oh, every time. It, would just, it, it was ridiculous, you know. It would just, yeah. 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 So it was a, a fabricated emotion. But, yeah, I don't know. It was a lot of like paper back and forth, just a lot of throwing the paper and throwing the hair. <laughs> An angst, yes. It was a lot of angst. Angsty. Well, you know, that was a fun number to work on because it was another time that we worked with this choreographer in L.A., a dancer, um, and we worked with him on our, our Sexy Back show program, and then we did Chopin with him, and then we did Bleeding Love and a couple other things too. And it was just it, it was so fun to get outside of choreographing on the ice and in the rink and to work with, um, to work in the studio, and you know, always had a lot of just a different element to it. And uh, I remember he was like, "You should, you should write Leona Lewis a letter and say thank you because it's such a great song, and then you guys are and so it was such a wonderful number for you to do." And um, it was that was fun to do that and to have that that experience where it's just very different, mm-hmm. a different perspective. Um, it's always challenging to adapt from the floor to the ice but um that one of the i think we don't have that many programs where we had we got to do that and so that was kind of special with that program it's very memorable and we thank you guys so much for going back and reliving your career with us we hope you <laughs> thank have you fun in japan and we're so excited to see you guys back out on the ice so thank you for coming on the skating Live.